So I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, first of all, I would like to, uh, my name is Jennifer Summers. I am the treasurer of the Wisconsin chapter of the Wildlife Society. And I would like to thank you all for joining us today. And so um, this is the brown bag webinar series put on by the Wisconsin chapter of the Wildlife Society's membership committee. If you are not a member yet, you should consider joining. Um, we have a lot, of, a lot of things to offer our members. It's only $20 to join. Um, so we have like these webinars, we have our annual meeting, we often, uh, we do technical trainings from time to time, there's some networking opportunities to some of, with some of Wisconsin's finest wildlife professionals. So if you haven't joined us yet, consider doing so. Again, $20 and uh, you can do so by going up to our website. Um, if you just Google Wisconsin Chapter of the Wildlife Society, uh, you'll, you'll find our website and you can go, go to there. Um, today, you are, uh, we are hosting uh, Colleen Matula and she's going to be talking about forestry for the birds. Um, so we have other webinars. We ho host these webinars once every uh, once a month, uh, the second Wednesday of every month, except for March this year, because our, that's going to be when our annual meeting is taking place. And we'd really like to encourage you to join our meeting. Um, that is going to be the 7th through the 10th, and it's it, in March. It's going to be virtual. And if you're interested in presenting, please do so. We are extending our call for abstracts until January 31st, and we are welcoming both oral and poster presentations. So if you haven't, uh, if you are interested in presenting at our meeting, please get your abstracts in. Um, an email went out recently. Um, again, you can go to our website uh, for more information. Um, the next webinar is coming up. We have one coming up in February. Uh, we'll be featuring Kevin Wallenfang and Kurt Rollman, um, Rollman, and they will be talking about CWD in Wisconsin. Uh, again, no, no webinar in March. And then in April, we'll be hosting Jennifer Price Tack and Drew Fowler, and they will be discussing uh, structured deci decision making. If you miss a webinar, most of them are available through our YouTube channel. So if you go to YouTube and, and search for Wisconsin Chapter of the Wildlife Society, these webinars are recorded and they're available on our YouTube channel. Um, except for there's a, occasionally we have a couple that are available only by request. Um, but Otherwise, without further ado, I would like to introduce our speaker today. Um, our speaker today is Colleen Matula, who and she has worked as a forest ecologist slash silviculturalist for the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources Division of Forestry for the last 20 years. Prior to the WDNR, she worked for the US Forest Service for 10 years in the ecology and forestry programs for both Shawamagan Nicolay National Forest and Ottawa National Forest. She received her uh, bachelor's degree, bachelor's of science degree from Northland College and her master's from University of Wisconsin Eau Claire with an emphasis in forest ecology. Throughout her career, she has focused on topics such as adaptive management, silvicultural trials, invasive species, but most recently on lowland ash ecosystems. She enjoys multiple forms of outdoor recreation and believes that every forester should know to be issued a fat tire bike for work and wellness. <laughs> so <laughs> Colleen, welcome. Uh, thank you all uh, for having me. I'm uh, very flattered to be uh, a part of your session here today. Um, does everything sound good so far? Good. All right. If you if you encounter some issues, just uh, give me a high five here. So as Jennifer was saying, um, I've been involved with the DNR for um, working as a forest ecologist and silviculturalist for 20 years. But prior to that, I was with the the Ottawa National Forest and the Shawamigan as well. And, and it's here both with the DNR and then also with the Forest Service that I was involved in several initiatives um, that were forest and bird related. So on the Ottawa, I organized uh, the breeding bird censuses for several years um, and that was quite a while ago. And um, in 2005, I was part of the managed old growth silviculture study. And this had a lot to do with all aspects of um, incorporating silviculture, but also with birds. I did the some bird um, breeding bird plots um, throughout the, the area. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a bit. But most recently I've been involved with um, a steering committee for BCR 12, which is Bird Conservation Region 12. And it's a, a bird initiative uh, that focuses on forest um, birds in Canada and then also Northern um, in the upper Great Lakes. So the overview today is to give you a large scale view 
down to a local view approach. I'd like to cover the status of Wisconsin forests. Um, talk a little bit about forest habitat features that um, maybe help uh, birds a little bit, enhance the bird community in those forests. Talk a little bit about bird guilds because I think that's a, a very interesting approach to um, incorporating, enhancing bird, uh, birds in forested areas. And then also um, talk about a habitat assessment that I think foresters and wildlifers can use in the field and with uh, landowners. I'd like to talk a little bit about that Manage Old Growth Silviculture Study because it has a segment that focuses on bird, uh, bird studies. And then uh, wrap it up with um, resources and publications that I think um, are important for you that I use today in my presentation. And then um, throughout um, my PowerPoint, I'm gonna give you a little Matula Zen guide to forest birding um, because uh, I, I love birding on, just on the sidelines outside of my job. And then I'm gonna wrap up the whole PowerPoint with um, interactive uh, fun, a little activity for us. So on the right here is one of many favorite birds of mine. But this is the harbinger of spring for me. Um, I have a sugar bush um, that I've been operating for about 25 years um, in Northern Iron County. And um, one of the Zen parts of my forest birding is listening to the brown creeper um, in the early spring. It reminds me that, hey, you know, spring is waking up and, um, you know, that's, that's part of that Zen birding, you know, I, you know, I don't, I leave my phone back at home. I just um, leave the apps back at home. I just sit and watch the brown creeper going up and down, spiraling around the bark of the birches that I have in my sugar bush. So let's talk a little bit about um, the status. Um, with over 16 million acres of Wisconsin forest, you know, populations of our woodland birds are in decline. The declines are as great as 80% or more over the last four decades. And I know you've, you've heard this, but also more than hundred bird species make their home in Wisconsin woodlands, especially in the Northern part of our state. They use um, these areas for breeding in the summer, for resting and refueling and, and for um, breeding and also winter grounds as well. But with this presentation, hopefully you can identify, maintain, enhance, and enjoy you know, forestry for the birds. So here I have, um, you know, a map that shows um, the northern forest, and there's a, a large number of bird species in the red area, the richest mix of forest bird species in the U.S in our area and, and it follows the similar lines to BCR 12, which is Bird Conservation Region 12. And that's something to think about as we think about the declines in our woodland bird species. A little bit about forest statistics in Wisconsin. We have 35 million acres of uh, land and about 46% of it is forested. And it's steadily increasing, especially in the northern part of the state. So forests are expanding. They're um, covering a lot of ground in Wisconsin. But I want to tell you that 60% of that forested acreage is privately owned. So that gives me a clue, and hopefully you, that we need to work with our private landowners on educating awareness on a lot of conservation issues specifically about uh, forests and birds and how we can accommodate their needs. To the right, I show a, a map here. All uh, of green is in our forested areas of the state, um, predominantly in maple and oak, and then also in aspen. Another forest statistics we talk about is forest productivity. Um, right now, forest growth has outpaced our removals. There's more acreage in that 60 to 80 year age class. Um, there's um, out of the total acres of forest in Wisconsin, but we see some concerns, lack of regeneration in some of our cover types. Some foresters have a difficult time regenerating oak, just like on the pictures to the right, we have Bayfield County 
has a, a deer fence, 12 acre deer fence, where um, behind Andrew right here in this picture um, is a fence and inside the fence is tree species regenerating after a shelter would harvest. But outside of that deer fence is, um, you know, the browse indications that we see on the ground. But that's not the only thing. There are other concerns. There's earthworm, there's insect and disease, there's other forest health issues that contribute to the regeneration decline. So those are things to keep on the radar. I, I can't be remiss without uh, talking about climate change and forest health. Um, with our forest, we have pest, disease, and invasive species impacting forest ecosystems and the whole forest succession. Um, when we think about climate change, we think about impacts to the function and the health and also the productivity of forests. But that in turn affects all the wildlife that we see um, and encounter in our woods. And especially in the northern latitudes, a lot of the boreal forests are being uh, greatly impacted by climate change. So we're encountering warmer and shorter winters, more precipitation, larger storm events, lo longer growing seasons. Could that be a positive or could it be a negative that impacts um, trees? So here we have emerald ash borer affecting um, our uh, black lowland ash trees and also um, the upland ash as well. That is causing a significant impact to a forest system um, and a wetland system that we have great concerns with. To the left here, I have a, a picture of tamarack with buckthorn in the understory. A lot of concerns to be um, on the radar. And now I'd like to transition because I work up north and I do cover the whole state. I'm a statewide resource, but um, I do focus. Uh, a lot on these northern cover types, such as northern hardwood, oak, pine, aspen, and elm and ash. So what I wanna talk about is start incorporating into my presentation, the forest habitat characteristics that we should focus on, because those are the keys to perhaps working on enhancing those conditions to help and enhance bird species. So we, here we have a, a chart that depicts, and this is from the Vermont Audubon Club. Um, they have a forestry for birds program. And I uh, took this chart from their, one of their guidebooks on uh, forestry for the birds. And it depicts um, a key to habitat features that talks about the forest structure and habitat layers, which are so important to birds. So we have the overstory, um, the light gray lines, and we have the midstory, and we also have the understory. These are areas that you all know are important for bird species, whether it's foraging or nesting or just um, resting. <laughs> and one way of uh, enhancing bird habitat is to understand forest bird guilds. And this is only one way, there's probably multiple ways to think about birds and forests and how to enhance bird habitat. But one approach that I'd like to offer today is by looking at forest bird guilds. And I looked at several resources to understand a little bit more about uh, forest bird guilds. And um, a lot of them had to do with foraging uh, and how birds forage. And you know, we have birds that are frugivores, insectivores, granivores. We have birds that are bark leaners and scalers. So let's look at some of these bird guild examples. The overstory gleaners. You know, you're out doing some bird surveys and you're looking up and you can't really see that scarlet tanager because they're part of that overstory gleaner. Same with the Northern Parilla, the Black Bernie and Warbler, and some Vireos. Now, some of the things to think about as a forester and even a wildlifer is to think about the forest canopy closure within that stand and how that would impact some of these species. The next bird guild to think about are those mid-story gleaners. 
We have um, the black and white warbler, black throated green warbler, wood thrush, and uh, the peewee that likes to hang out in the mid story. Not all the time, but um, they tend to like to nest in some of those areas, especially the black and white warbler. When you're in a stand and you're a forester thinking about things and how to enhance wildlife conditions, you're thinking about increasing vertical and horizontal structure. And how can this be done? Well, maybe by incorporating more canopy gaps. Now on a side note, one time when I was working um, on that managed old growth silviculture study, I had one of those Zen moments in birding and forest birding. I just sat down and I started looking at um, this canopy gap. It was harvested about a couple of years prior to that uh, when I was doing the bird surveys there. And all of a sudden I saw this black and white warbler going up and down, up and down in this canopy gap. And I'm thinking, my gosh, this bird really likes this vertical and horizontal structure. This is really important and it reinforces the fact that um, increasing vertical and horizontal structure in stands is really important for habitat. The next bird guild is uh, understory and ground gleaners. Here we might have the oven bird, hermit thrush or yellow bellied sapsucker hanging out in, in these areas, not all the time, but they tend to like these areas. Um, you know, as a forester, um, we might want to think about creating more downwoody debris or enhancing those conditions. The other day, I got a call from a forester, and there was a large wind event that went through um, an area over in Rhinelander this past December. And a landowner called and said, you know, my hemlock stand, seven acres, it all blew down. And then the forester asked me, you know, what, what should we do? What kind of recommend, recommendation should I give that landowner? And I said, hey, this is a wonderful opportunity for um, leaving the down woody debris right there on site instead of salvaging it. It's one option, it's one alternative, but um, what we're seeing is we, we don't have enough down woody debris um, in these forested stands. And this is an opportunity to increase that over time. The air, air salliers, that's the next uh, bird guild. They're perched, they're waiting for that catch. They're usually in the canopy looking for um, prey and foraging for insects, the fly catchers. You might have a Cooper's hawk in, in um, the upper canopy waiting for that catch for the next Tweety bird that comes along. Here we might want to think, um, as foresters think about create a variety of canopy gaps, not just the small ones, but maybe the larger ones, because that might increase the, the prey species that are um, so important to these birds. So next I want to toggle into, so we went from bird guilds, now let's take a look at habitat assessment. And how do we do this? Well, here I have um, a form that you know anyone, including a landowner, could use yeah, on their woodlot or their forested stand, looking at all the features that I'm starting to talk about. So this is a form, um, a part of reconnaissance in a forested stand, looking at canopy height, um, documenting what you have. Do you have a uniform overstory or patch? Um, do you have um, understory composition? What is it like? These are all the features to start documenting in a stand um, that you want to first think about enhancing for birds. Is there soft mass? Now, my God, this year, um, there, this is a masting year. And a masting year is, means there's, there's a lot of seed for birds out there. Um, hemlock cones are so abundant this year that I've been seeing a lot of those um, white winged um, crossbills, um, you know, foraging on those hemlock cones. Um, I've been seeing a lot of birds gravitating to um, yellow birch and white birch because we have a huge seed um, mass production on site. So those are the things to look, look for. Is that available to the, 
in that stand um, to produce soft mast for foraging. And then non-native invasive woody plants, um, leaf litter, is it adequate? Sometimes we have earthworm problems that affect the leaf litter. Leaf litter is important to some bird species. Coarse woody debris, um, I know um, we have a, a team that has been working on assessing coarse woody debris, especially down woody debris by doing um, transects through the woods to see what sizes of down woody debris we have and what kind of de decay class they're in. And we're finding there's not a whole lot of down woody debris in the woods in these second growth forests. So the next things to think about and to provide and maintain habitat for birds is thinking about those developmental stages that these forests are in. Some forest attributes readily develop while other, others are just so complex and it takes time for some of these um, attributes to develop. So in the developmental stages of a forest, we might have stand initiation, then it grows up into that stem exclusion stage. Um, and then as the stand starts breaking up a little bit and you know maybe um, starting to create a little more of that downwoody debris, we have uh, more of a reinitiation stage and then eventually old growth. But when a landowner comes to me and says, I want old growth and I want it now, <laughs> you know, what am I supposed to say? Well, it's going to take some time. So those are the things to consider when we're out there managing these forests. Now, I wanted to give you a little bit about what a forester goes through when they're developing a per the prescription process and how we can incorporate bird considerations into the prescription process. This is a very busy chart and I don't expect you to digest it, but one thing I want to show you is that ultimately a prescription is written um, you know, for a landowner objective. What does that landowner want on the ground or the property manager? Or take a state forest. Maybe a state forest has a master plan that drives the um, management in certain areas. So I'm asking where should the bird considerations come in to this whole process? Well, the next stage of this whole process is uh, the forester goes out and does a forest inventory. This might be a good spot for bird considerations to be thought about. You know, um, foresters take a lot of data when they're in the forest. They take data on density and structure site quality, uh, soils, stand health, and the landscape context of things. And then they start developing the stand pres prescription. So maybe at all levels would be some good ideas to start incorporating bird considerations into a stand prescription. So the next slide I have is a little bit more busy, but I know you're asking this, in your mind is, so where do we start incorporating these ecological considerations to enhance bird habitat? Well, here we have a silviculture prescription written by a forester and he's highlighted or she has highlighted um, design criteria or conditions that support these ecological attributes, especially for birds. In this uh, stand prescription, they talk about leaving trees like hemlock, yellow birch, and white pine. And they also talk about canopy gaps and the size of canopy gaps that would go into managing that stand, which are so important for birds. Next, they talk about the species um, composition of tree species to leave by reserving oak and yellow birch especially near those canopy gaps so they can regenerate within the gap. This particular STAM prescription um, talks about retaining large trees over 19 inches, which is important for bird species. Um, other things, um, higher stocking near hemlock so it can protect some of the hemlock stems in the area, den trees um, for wildlife, and then also addressing and implementing best management practices for water quality. 
So a lot of this is in the stand prescription, and this is implemented on the ground when in the field, when marking that timber sale. And foresters tend to reflect on this and they implement it in the marking. So what are some of the features that we see in forestry that can enhance birds habitat? Well, let's take a look at this. Cavity trees are really important for bird species and maybe bark. Bark is a really important, the bark characteristic of certain tree species is really important, not only for birds, but also for bats. Um, as the tree gets older, the bark might develop, um, you know, have more uh, development uh, for nesting like you see here. And the quiz question for you is, what bird nest is this? So I'm gonna let you think about that. And maybe you can answer at the end of this presentation. I'll give you a hint. This is a yellow birch tree, a very big old yellow birch tree on the Ashland County Forest. So the cavity trees here and bark are really important. Foresters might leave a large diameter tree and maybe a variety of species of trees with large diameter. Anything over about 20 inches in diameter, some of the uh, sawmills won't even take uh, those large diameter trees. So um, leaving these are so important for wildlife and not only birds. So the next design criteria or a condition that a forester and a wildlifer can help um, enhance for birds is perches and down logs. Now, one of my favorite biologists, Michelle Woodford, has been sharing some pictures with me and I, I've um, incorporated this in um, my presentation here. So the drumming, drumming log is important, um, maybe logs for butcher blocks for raptors, and even those down, down logs for um, the invertebrates um, that uh, are so important as for foraging for some of the bird species we see. So for foresters thinking about the condition or a design criteria might be is to leave so many like 10 drumming logs per acre throughout the stand. Or you might um, recommend girdling trees to eventually fall over and create down woody debris. So these are some things that can be incorporated into a silviculture prescription. Um, I've seen a wide variety of design criteria written up um, and prescribed. Um, and you know, you know, one example was those drumming logs. It happens to be in several stand prescriptions that I've seen of late. So the next uh, habitat feature are snags and legacy trees. Um, a quiz question, um, what are the best trees to leave as snags? I'm gonna let you think about that for one minute. What are the best trees? Well, the answer is it depends. Um, you know, I've talked with many wildlife folks about what are the best snags to leave and every, everyone has a different answer as far as species to leave. And I know I've talked to Ron Eckstein, I've talked to you know, several other people, and, and as long as we're leaving snags and legacy trees in the forest, that will help develop those characteristics that are needed for bird habitat. And here we have a pileated woodpecker that is, it's dubbed the, the great architect of forests. Um, and the reason why they, I, I was reading a publication one time on, uh, on the pileated woodpecker and um, in this publication, this research, they named the pileated woodpecker as the great landscape architect of forests. It's because they go from tree to tree, spreading the spores from the fungi that break down the dead wood um, and the snags that it's um, drilling holes in. So. And um, so that's, it's building that function and spreading, uh, you know, the fungi that's needed to break down um, the snags in that forest and pro providing nutrients to the understory. The next feature, design feature are canopy gaps. Canopy gaps are usually installed in Northern hardwood stands, but they can be uh, 
installed and uh, harvested in um, you know, all kinds of different uh, forest types, but um, northern hardwood is the main one. And installing a range of sizes and numbers per acre of canopy openings are very important because it creates that vertical and also horizontal structure. So here we have a very small canopy gap to the left. And then above here, I have a photo of a canopy gap that's starting to fill in um, with um, understory saplings. Um, and that's important structure to have in the stand for all types of wildlife. And uh, just on a side note, when we're installing gaps, we have to think about canopy caps will close. So as the forest continues to grow, these canopy gaps will close. So a small gap, like a 35 foot gap, depending on the size of the trees, uh, some of those gaps uh, might close 10 feet per year. That's what we've been seeing and some, it depends on the developmental stage of the forest, but um, canopy gaps close pretty fast um, if they're small. So a 35 foot gap is a small gap. So this gap would be marked out and it would be harvested um, when the rest of the stand is harvested. And eventually, um, you know, a couple of years later, we'll see the developmental stages of saplings and regeneration coming into that gap um, as we see. And when I've been doing bird surveys, I've noticed that um, post-treatment after the gap is har harvested, birds will respond within two years um, after the harvest is done in that gap. So it's pretty amazing is putting these gaps and the birds will, will start showing up. Another design feature to think about or condition to think about are water features and leaf litter. These are so important for birds and other wildlife. And we have to think about our BMPs for water, water quality to protect these features. So some uh, silviculture prescriptions that I've seen across you know, the state, um, foresters have written designating certain tree species um, on the side of ephemeral pond designating a certain density or basal area around um, a water feature. So it could be leaving the density of stems around these features or even the species um, of trees to leave. So there's a wide range of um, things to consider. Um, and this happens to be an, a really important feature for um, birds, not only to for drinking and bathing, but also um, foraging as well. These ephemeral ponds are um, loaded with all kinds of invertebrates. And uh, the, our forestry division does have an ephemeral uh, pond study and we have the report, I believe it's on our website. And if you'd like a copy of it, I can um, send you a copy uh, about the whole study. So as I'm winding down here, I'm um, thinking about, well, what kind of silviculture studies do we have in Wisconsin that, that might incorporate a little bit about birds and, and enhancing bird habitat? And the one that comes to mind that I've been part of is called the Managed Old Growth Silviculture Study, or we affectionately call it MOSS. So this was a long-term research study that was implemented in 2005. I helped with the silviculture and tree marking guides in 2005. And then I helped with um, marking and setting up the sales, the timber sales. And there's three replicate areas and that happens to be the Flambeau River State Forest, uh, the Northern Highland American Legion State Forest, and then the Forest Service Schwamigan Nicolay Argonne Experimental Station. So we have um, some areas that are about 300 acres each, each site, that are being studied for all kinds of attributes um, that, uh, such as old growth attributes that we can implement um, while we're implementing silviculture. So these things would be leaving big trees, snags, incorporating um, and recognizing cavity trees, um, how to create more coarse woody debris in these areas by girdling trees, 
and then also studying the sapling layer. So, you know, before they started the study, and this was Carl Martin and part of the science services department of the, um, of, of the DNR, but now it's under the direction of uh, Amanda McGraw in our forest research section. When they first started the, the study, all the other research that was going on on old growth was, um, so what are the questions we should ask about old growth versus managed forests? What are so different about old growth versus managed forests? And the large part it, about the differences is acknowledging that there's differences in structural complexity. And these drawings right here depict the differences between old growth and managed forest. Of course, there are so many other differences, but this talks a little bit about that vertical and horizontal structure that's missing in these managed forests. So, and you can see by comparison, there's quite a development of um, understory, you know, saplings in the old growth. Managed forest might not have a lot of that. And then with this moss study, um, to further uh, look at some forest characteristics, um, looking at forest old growth characteristics, and they looked at snag retention, down woody debris, you know, size classes um, of tree species and density and basal area. <clears throat> but over here, um, the forest research crew this past summer they were looking at the down woody debris uh, assessments, and this is what they're doing in this picture. So all these features are really important to, to bird species and all other types of wildlife as well. So part of this moss study and doing these breeding bird surveys before it was harvested and after the harvest looked at determining bird associations with forest habitat characteristics. And some of the species um, they focused on, and the, the main PI on the study is um, Mike Worland. He is now a non-game specialist for Minnesota, but he, he's still looking at and analyzing the data. They're looking at, um, you know, the old growth associates, such as like brown creeper, winter wren, black Bernian warbler, and then some of the species of greatest concern. So that might be like the wood thrush, black-billed cuckoo, and um, the viri. So with this study, um, they have found, and, it, and it's still really preliminary data, um, because it's taking a while to analyze, is that increasing structural diversity is really good for increasing bird species density and, and the species that we see in these stands. So the harvest in this stand, um, in the study started, um, the harvest was in 2007, the winter of 2007. And there were pre-treatment uh, pre and post-treatment um, plots that were taken, um, the breeding bird plots. And this was conducted by a, a large pool of people. Um, too many people to recognize here, but Mike Worland was the primary investigator. And what he's finding from his data, and he's just analyzing it right now and writing up a publication, he found that there are increases in bird density and species, especially with morning warblers, black-throated blue warblers, and eastern wood pee peewee, as it responds to gaps, putting in these gaps and having these gaps harvested. So you can see by the data after the harvest, um, you know, in these 35 foot gaps, these species are really, you know, they're responding to that structure, that both horizontal and vertical structure. And I'd have to say in my observational um, assessments, as I'm looking at forested stands all over the state, I do see uh, when foresters designate canopy gaps and they're harvested, I see these species coming in to northern hardwood stands especially. So stay tuned for more analysis and publications from this moss study. There's so many other things that um, the moss crew, uh, Amanda McGraw and her crew, 
are looking at. Um, there's a lot of publications that have been uh, published and I can provide them for you, but this one in particular is just being developed right now. So as I'm winding down here, um, I'd like to you know, reiterate and summarize some of the important points here. So, so as a program, a forestry program and wildlife and multiple agencies, I have to identify that we need to collaborate more. We used to have these round tables where we would discuss the important habitat features for a wide variety of species. So collaboration is really important and maybe setting up a round table to discuss these attributes are really important. I also think that providing more outreach and education to landowners is, is paramount. You know, they are the largest forest landowners in the state. So um, they own 60% of the forested land in the state. So we need to do a better job, both wildlife and forestry and all other groups and agencies, we need to do a better job of educating our landowners and how to get that message across. Keeping up with forest and bird statistics are really important as well. The bird populations are, are readily changing um, due to a wide variety of impacts that I can't even mention today because there's such a long list. Um, and keeping up with the forest statistics in our state is really important as well. And we just rolled out last year at the end of the year, um, the State Forest Action Plan. And you can find out more of those forest statistics um, in that uh, State Forest Action Plan on our forestry website. I think a, a good way, it's not the only way to appro approach and enhance these habitat features. I think it ties in with these bird gills. And I, I really, as I'm doing my Zen birding, you know, I'm just sitting down, I forget the apps at home, and I just look at what the birds are doing in response to a, a snag in the woods or in response to um, a canopy gap or in response to all these features that are so tied in with um, bird guilds. Another uh, bullet point that I have here is we have a large acreage of demonstration forests in our state. We actually have 10 demonstration forests uh, managed by the state of Wisconsin. So I think these would be great opportunities to maybe incorporate more bird studies um, and other silviculture studies as well. We also should learn from applied silviculture and bird studies. That uh, is going to be um, real important, especially that uh, moss, that managed old growth study, um, as it uh, impacts a lot of um, things and in, in attributes in our forest. And then also learn from other states. Now, the forestry for the bird program is um, being discussed in, discussed in Wisconsin. We're talking um, several agencies and partners and people. We're trying to sit down at the table and talk about, you know, how, what is the best information that we can get out to people? And there's a lot of people involved in that. But other states such as Michigan and Vermont, Vermont Audubon, uh, Kentucky, North, uh, New Hampshire, these are states that already have a forest for the bird program that reaches out to not only landowners, but to the loggers and to the foresters of those states. Um, and it has a lot of tools for all these entities that I just mentioned. And I think we are talking about it in the state of Wisconsin, but it's just, it's slow to come. And I, I'm hopefully this will get going. And of course, here we have our state chief forester here, uh, Heather Berklin. She was part of that managed old growth silviculture study as well. So now my question for you is how can you get more involved in this? Because it's not only the forester's job, it's not only the wildlifer's job, but it's all of us getting involved in getting the word out. So we do have a lot of public outreach. We have some wonderful bird organizations. Um, you know, I work with the Manitwish Bird um, 
organization over there. Um, there's the Schwamigan Bird um, Organization. There's a lot of uh, great, great entities where we can integrate ideas and take a look at public outreach, not for just the little old ladies, but for everyone. And um, second would be maybe doing those habitat assessments, looking at what features in those stands that we have. And here we have a forester in Ashland County looking at this big old yellow birch. And then that he's actually going to leave. He's not going to have this one cut. Um, I've talked to him about this. Um, and then lastly is those demonstration forests that I mentioned. And as I wind down here, um, there are an abundance of publications and resources. Um, so for the, the bird guilds, uh, I relied on a really old publication from 1985. Um, some of you are familiar with it, but it talks a lot about foraging guilds of, guilds of North American birds. It's really a good one. Forestry for the birds, like I said, um, our programs in multiple states. I recently listened to a wonderful ecological forestry webinar from Dr. Tony D'Amato from University of Vermont. He, ha he also has a webinar on forestry for the birds. Alec Alexis Grinde from the Natural Resource Research Institute has a lot of research going on on birds and forests. And there's just, just some excellent web, webinars from you know, a wide variety of other organizations. Um, and then of course we have our uh, managed old growth civil culture study that incorporates um, some of those studies um, into that um, whole research. And then um, lastly, I, I have my contact information here, but um, we're, before I answer some questions, I know there might be an abundance of questions out there, but um, I want to do this activity. We'll see if it works. It's this interactive activity. Um, this actually happens to be the Manitowish Bird Club um, that uh, I've done some programs for, and then I also help them out during their um, festival during May. This is the group at activity. So uh, I'm gonna have Jennifer um, put this, this whole link into the chat box and in your browser, preferably Chrome browser, I'd like you to link to, um, to Padlet. And what we're doing here is a group activity. And I'd like to hear from you. What are some of the important opportunities and challenges for bird converse, conservation in Wisconsin. And you're probably wondering, oh, what are you gonna use this information for? Well, I, I'd like to know from you, what are some important challenges that you run into or opportunities? And some of this I am gonna bring to the table at some of my other meetings that I, and other um, initiatives that I work on, but I'd like to hear from you. So right now I'm gonna share that Padlet and see what kind of feedback I'm gonna get from you. So hopefully this works. And then we'll come back with questions towards the last five minutes. All right, so. So this is the Padlet exercise. It, it enables you to provide input and I'm starting to see it um, being inputted here. I hope you can all see this. If you can't see this uh, as I'm sharing the screen, um, please tell me because I want this to work. <laughs> So what do we see here? We see public outreach and education. We see climate change. This is wonderful. Thank you for doing this. Keep on populating this Padlet exercise. Fire, fire, and more fire. Importance of both early and late successional forests. Absolutely. MFL plans are being written to transition. 
Uh, Northern hardwoods and away from supporting oak. Excellent. More collaboration between partners and organizations. I agree. Time scale. Yep, time scale is so important, as I mentioned. Forest managed for products only. That's right, climate change. We have a specific comment here about forestry coverts workshop that engages private land owners. I am well aware of it. it's a great, great program. Include tribal par partnerships, excellent. Invasive species, keep on populating this. You get three more minutes. <laughs> Enlist bird watching communities to advocate for forest preservation. That's a great one. Incent incentives for private ownership engagement. That's, that's one that we've been working on for a long time. And as the padlets are still coming in, let there be wildlife biologists and not only game managers. That's a good one. Work with farmers to pre pre preserve tree stands. Excellent. I like this padlet because it's it seems to be a little bit more of a collaborative pro process here. And I, I really wanted to hear from you instead of me blabbing all the time here. <laughs> this is really good. Working with natural resource university students on collaborative approaches. Provide alternatives for clear cutting Aspen. Okay, we'll give it a, a couple more minutes, but even after this uh, webinar, you can still populate um, this Padlet exercise and I will be certain to bring this to my um, next meetings um, where there's bird and forest initiatives at the table, because I think this is really important. Yeah, so I hope you can see this. And if anybody would like a copy um, of what is being um, said right here, I can provide um, a copy of this Padlet information to you um, after we're done here. So I actually uh, <clears throat> use this um, particular activity for um, foresters uh, commenting on degraded hardwood stands. So this is my second attempt at um, getting some feedback from my audience. So excellent. So here we have a host joint workshop with professional forestry wildlife groups. We, you know, we used to do that. We used to have these joint sessions, forestry and wildlife, but um, I haven't been to one for a long time or I haven't seen one available. Okay, well, I, I think that's, Good for now, you can still populate Padlet and, um, but I'm gonna stop sharing. And I just wanted to end my presentation here. Um, you know, you, you got a little just of my Zen of birding. Um, I think it's really important for us to just look at those observations in the woodland and, um, you know, just observe what's happening in your backyard. And I think this is important for us to convey to private landowners as well. So, um, you know, you might, you don't, you don't even need to have a, um, you know, I have a sugar bush and I've been operating it for about 25 years and I've been 
I'm noticing a lot of different changes occur over time. And, and that brown creeper that I showed you um, in the beginning uh, of the session, um, yeah, that, that little guy, I still see him, but uh, there's been some concerns with brown creepers too, so. Okay, well, I will take a few questions now. We, we do have um, about four minutes left. So should I just read them out of the chat box or? I can, I, if you'd like, or I could read them to you. Um, looks like uh, Elizabeth is asking, is there a particular type of stand that is very poor for bird numbers and diversity? And she continues and says, it seems to me that uh, very thick young aspen stands about five to 20 years old are relatively devoid of birds or maybe she's missing something. <laughs> Um, well, um, I can say that depends. That's an answer that uh, has another one of those words that's, um, it, it depends on where you're at across the landscape. I, I do see in Aspen stands, I do see um, a response after a couple years after the harvest. So, um, you know, um, yeah, so I, I'm wondering, where you're located, um, that it could be uh, across the lands landscape. But the diversity part, there is a suite of early successional species that would focus on aspen stands that I do see um, responding. So um, I, and then a follow up question was, do you ever lead tours of demonstration forests? And I have led uh, demonstrations. Um, one demonstration forest that I'm close to is the, called the Urenholt Forest in Sealy um, near Hayward. And um, I, I have led tours over there, so. Um, let's see, are there any state lands being managed for Kirtland warblers? Um, not exactly state lands. Um, there might be some state lands, but more so um, county lands. So, and I haven't been directly involved in that. And I'd like to defer to Nick Anich and uh, Ryan Brady. Those those folks are the best, and um, I'm sure they could answer that question. But I know for the large part, um, there's some counties that are managing for Kirtland warblers. So I would like a copy of the study you mentioned, as well as a copy of all these great ideas. And yep, I can send them to you, Teresa, you betcha. Do you have ideas or thoughts about the decline in Connecticut warbler population and what might be done to help them? So Ryan Brady uh, has been featured in, I think on public radio, and then also um, perhaps in um, some of articles and publications on uh, Connecticut warbler populations in Wisconsin. He would be the authority to talk about, uh, talk to um, about Connecticut warbler. But yes, we've been seeing um, a decline in these and it, it could be because of a large variety of reasons. Um, there is a, a larger population of Connecticut warblers in Canada. So what's happening in Canada during the breeding season. Um, and then what's happening in their um, winter grounds. Um, so those, those are some questions about the Connecticut warbler. And um, I know they do like those shrubby wetlands and uh, tamarack sometimes tamarack bogs and jack pine as well. So um, those are the areas. I did see one con Connecticut warbler on the Ottawa National Forest when I was doing a breeding bird uh, plot over there, but that was long time ago. And that was in one of those shrubby tamarack stands. So I'm gonna jump in here. We're right at one o'clock. Um, so um, we're going to have so we have to wrap it up. But for those of you, I know I'm, I'm going to stick around with Colleen here for a minute just so that uh, we can make sure to get those emails to her if you are if you're wanting a copy of that uh, of the study. 
and there was a comment here um, uh, for, about how to get a copy of this talk. I will be loading this to our YouTube channel. Um, so if you go to YouTube and, and search for Wisconsin Chapter of the Wildlife Society, uh, I hope to get this up in the, in the, the coming days. It'll, it should be up by the end of the week um, onto our YouTube channel. And then finally, um, I'd like to thank everybody for coming. And I'd also like to thank the North Central section of the Wildlife Society for promoting this talk to their membership. Um, so that was very, that was very, um, very kind of them. And so we're so ha happy to have the turnout that we did. So again, thank you very much. And everybody um, have a great day. Thanks, everyone.